Good evening, everyone. We invite you to turn to the book of Ezekiel, chapter number four. The book of Ezekiel, chapter number four. The Lord is going to begin now to tell um, Ezekiel and set him forth for one of his first, or if not his first mission, and that which he is supposed to do. The first three chapters have been getting him indoctrinated in how to walk with God and how to walk before the people. And in verse 1 of chapter 4, Thou also, son of man, take thee a towel. Any of you got backsplashes behind your sink in your kitchen? What's it made out of? It's usually just tiles, isn't it? So this is just porcelain, in my mind, a square porcelain block or piece. And lay it before thee and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem. So draw out a picture of Jerusalem, the outline, the sky, you know, the, the landscape and the skyline and lay it before thee. And then he says, and lay siege against it, and build a fort against it, and cast a mount against it. Set the camp also against it, and set battering rams against it round about. Now, what two words did you hear the most of in verse number two? Second word is it. Against it. So he just continually tells him to make sure that everybody knows that this thing is going to be on, uh, there's going to be an onslaught against Jerusalem. Moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan. And we know that God had to tell him to come from uh, Tel Aviv, verse 15 of chapter 3, the high place, and go down to the valley in chapter 13 and verse uh, 22 and 23. And then he says, go shut thyself up within thy house in verse 24 of chapter 3. Now, we know that he's in the house because I don't think he would be carrying his utensils out in the street with him. So here he is. He said, go in your kitchen and get you an iron pan and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city and set thy face, here we go again, against it and it shall be besieged and thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. Then he says, Lie thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquities. That's our subject thought tonight. Bear their iniquities. <clears throat> For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days, 390 days. God is very precise. He tells him exactly what he wants him to do, how he wants him to do it, what uh, show and tell items he needs to be able to carry out what he wants to do. And this has to be accompanied by the Holy Spirit uh, into the minds and hearts of those that are looking there to understand and perceive the judgment of God against them. But God is saying, I remember exactly how many years you were sinful against me, and there's going to be uh, a requirement of Ezekiel to have a day for each year, 390 days, 390 years that you sinned against me. So thou shalt bear, verse 5, thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. The second time he said it. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side. And here we go again. Thou shalt bear the iniquities of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. So we find out that this is not unusual. God does this. Uh, in other places, we will see that tonight, God willing. 
And he says, I want you to be precise. I want you to do what I say because it means something to God. And if it means something to God, it should be conveyed to the people that it means something to them as well. Verse number 7 starts with a word that uh, is throughout the book of Ezekiel. I think there are 84 different therefores in Ezekiel. It was amazing to look all of them up. I didn't read every verse, but I looked at every phrase, therefore. And they're basically telling Israel there in this Babylonian captivity what is going to be the reaction of God because of their sin. You did this, that, and the other, therefore. 84 times God is going to tell them why he's judging them and how hard this judgment is going to be for them. Verse 7, Therefore thou shalt set thy face towards the siege of Jerusalem, and thine arm shall be uncovered, and thou shalt prophesy against it. You're not going to have your arm covered up. It's going to be as if the arm of God is not shortened, that it cannot uh, bring forth judgment. Uh, the, the hand and arm of God is going to be involved in this. And behold, I will lay bands upon thee, and thou shalt not turn thee from one side to another till thou hast ended the days of the siege. I'm going to help you to lay real still. Have you ever tried to lay still? You go to bed at night, how do you sleep? On your side? On your back? How do you wake up? In the same position? Well, no. And how many different positions are you in at night? Well, I'm just glad nobody can, can see. You ever had to go take an MRI? And the worst two words I ever heard was, don't move. And my leg was hurting so bad I couldn't hardly stand it. And if that had been a little rubber duck they gave me to squeeze, it wasn't, it was a ball. That duck would have been dead before they got out of the room good. It hurts so bad having to lay still. You think about it. Put yourself in this position. You got to lay here for as long as God says, 390 days on one, well, 390 days total, and 40 of that on your right side. And he said, don't worry, I'll put bands upon thee so you won't be able to turn. Take thou also unto thee wheat and barley and beans and lentils and millet and finches and put them in one vessel and make thee bread thereof according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon thy side. Three hundred and ninety days shalt thou eat thereof. And thy food, thy meat, which thou shalt eat, shall be by weight. You're going to have to measure it out. Twenty shekels a day. From time to time shalt thou eat it. And thou shalt drink also water by measure the sixth part of an hind, and from time to time shalt thou drink, and thou shalt eat it as barley cakes, and thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of man in their sight. And the Lord said, Even thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, whither I will drive them. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, my soul hath not been polluted, for from my youth up even until till now have I not eaten of that which di dieth of itself or is torn in pieces, neither came there abominable flesh into my mouth. Then he said unto me, Lo, I have given thee cow's dung for man's dung. I won't make you do that. I'm going to let you have cow's dung. And this is not really uncommon. Cow's dung or camel's dung that is dried out is, uh, is used as fuel in various places. Uh, poor parts of the world. Lo, I have given thee cow's dung for man's dung, and thou shalt prepare thy bread therewith. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, behold, I will break the staff of bread in Jerusalem, and they shall eat by bread, excuse me, and they shall eat bread by weight and with care. 
and they shall drink water by measure and with astonishment that they may want bread and water and be astonished one with another and consumed away for their iniquity. God is serious. It's too late now. The day of repentance is over with. The time of judgment has come. The anger of God is going to be seen. But Ezekiel is called to do something that you can't really understand if you just read the bare letter of it. You shall bear their iniquity. It says that several times as we read this chapter. What does it mean? It does not mean to forgive. Bearing their iniquity does not have anything to do with atonement. It has to do with symbolism. It is not, it doesn't say you shall forgive their iniquity. It says you shall bear their iniquity. Luke chapter 5, verse number 21. We need to back up one verse. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. <clears throat> and the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins, listen, but God alone? They were absolutely right, but they just didn't know that Jesus Christ was God. So this is absolutely right. Nobody can forgive sins but God alone. So we're not talking about redemption, atonement. We, we're, we're, we're not uh, talking about anything having to do with any forgiveness of sins, but just that you shall bear their sins. It's not vicarious, but it's symbolic. So he says, they say, who is this that which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts, whether it is easy to say thy sins be forgiven thee? Now remember, he said, which one is the easiest to say? He didn't say which one is it easy to do. He said, okay, anybody can just say thy sins be forgiven thee. He said, or to say rise up and walk well wait a minute now <clears throat> you can say either one of them real easy but if you say rise up and walk and he don't rise up and walk then you don't have any power at all even to forgive sins or to make him rise up and walk he said well just which one is it one of them can uh, must be followed by immediate uh, obedience and immediate action contrary to the man's current condition Whither is easy to say, thy sins be forgiven thee. Nobody can see that. Nobody can tell that. That would be easy to say. Well, what if I said, rise up and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man, listen, hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He saith unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house and immediately... He rose up before them and took up that wherein he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed. And they glorified God and were filled, filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. And I imagine... With God giving Ezekiel not only the instruction as to what to do, but the ability to do it, I will help you to lay still. I will bind you with bands, not literal physical bands, but I will fix it so that you will be able to lay still and act this thing out for these people. And therefore, they will see these things and come to understand that there's more to their condition here than what they realize that what's going on in Jerusalem 
is the reason that they are now in Babylon. Isaiah 43, the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, and verse number 25. I, even I, Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. Isn't that good? Our consciences remember our sins. Our enemies remember our sins. Those who wish us ill will remind us of sinful things that we did. But God said, I will not remember thy sins. Isn't that great? So God alone is the only one who can forgive sins. And turning to Isaiah 53, God alone is the only one that can blot them out and also never remember them anymore. They will never be brought up again. Isaiah 53 Verse 6, he was wounded for our transgressions. Amen, right? He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement, our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, with his stripes, we are healed. As God put the stripes upon him, Every stripe that he received was a healing for us. They said in England when they had a boy king, they had a whipping boy the same age. They were not allowed to whip the king. And when he did anything bad, they would call for the whipping boy. And the king would have to stand there and watch them whip that little boy who had not done anything wrong for him to take the punishment for the king's sins. In seeing my sin and understanding the principle of this verse, every time I'm reminded of my sin and my sinfulness is, I bow my head and ask the Lord Jesus to forgive me for what I did to him. He was wounded, not for his, but for my transgressions. He was Bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement for my peace. The chastisement for my peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Verse 11. He shall see, verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. How would you like to know that? That your father was pleased to bruise you. Just so listen this. We don't really know the depth and the, the width and the fullness of that which Jesus Christ suffered. Just the relationship between him and his father, and that's all he cried out on the cross. Why hast thou forsaken me? Cried out to his father. That was something that we can't even get into it very shallowly, but less in its depth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, the Lord, hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make, watch it now, his soul, they make a lot to do about the thorns, the nails, the spear, and well they should. I don't want to minimize them, not the slightest bit, but there's something with far more weight than that and that was making his soul an offering for sin you got to stick with that because in the next verse you're going to see he shall see his seed and he shall prolong his days the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand he was pleased to bruise him 
but the pleasure of the Lord would prosper in his hand when this thing is all worked out. Now, thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. It wasn't just Jesus' body that saved your soul. It wasn't just Jesus' body being tormented on the cross. It was his soul. Now, listen, verse 11. He, God the Father, shall see the travail of his, God the Son's, soul. And that's how God became satisfied. We see them picture a dead Jesus hanging on the cross. At least they say it's Jesus. God has forbidden all images of God whatsoever, but we cannot cease to do it. But it pleased the Lord to bruise him, to begin the atonement by bruising him, but that pleasure of the Lord will, as it works out, prosper in his hand. For God the Father shall see the travail of his soul that was made an offering for sin, and that's what's going to satisfy God on your behalf. Isn't that good? God is satisfied with you. Why can't you accept yourself? Hello? Why can't you accept who you are and be at peace with you? Why do you need to be taller or skinnier or richer or whatever? God shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied, completely satisfied spiritually by his knowledge, by the knowledge of him, shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall, three words, bear their, bear their iniquities. So Ezekiel was told time and time again, as we read you the entirety of chapter 4, we saw that phrase, you shall bear their iniquity. He had no ability to affect any atonement at all. He can't excuse the sin, much less cleanse anybody from it. It's the Son of Man alone who has the right to forgive sins on earth. And so here is the one he represented. So he had to stand, as the Apostle Paul said, we beseech you in Christ's stead. Let's turn that around. We beseech you instead of Christ. You've often heard it said in religion, and it's true. To somebody in this world, you're all of Jesus that anybody knows. Anybody remember Ms. Rouse? Used to come when we were meeting in Yonder. She was a preacher's daughter. And she came and she brought her little, was it a granddaughter? Jessa or some, I think her name was. And that little Jessa sat there and looked at me, and she thought I was God. And she asked Ms. Rouse, does God sleep here in this building? She's talking about me. I had no idea the little girl thought that. And I thought, my word, I got to shape up. You know, I, I got to cut out all this foolishness around here. And uh, she had a hard time trying to convince her, you know, what was going on around here. That's an extreme, I know, example. But here was Ezekiel, no different from us, called upon to act out the person of Jesus to a sinful nation. You ever heard anybody say, what you do talk so loud I can't hear what you say. We have to be careful, dear soul, that we might be examples to those who are around us. Now, he shall bear their iniquities. Let me show you that phrase. Ezekiel chapter number 1. And verse number 
19. You want to play our little game and you, you read three words when I stop? Ezekiel 119. When I stop, you get three words, okay? And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up, thou shalt bear is the exact same Hebrew word here translated were lifted up. Were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. So it's also in Ezekiel 29. In verse 15, Ezekiel 29 and verse 15, and you get four words. Ezekiel, Ezekiel 29, 15, when I stop, read me four words. It shall be the basis of the kingdoms, neither Shall it exalt itself is the same Hebrew word translated thou shalt bear. It's the same Hebrew word translated were lifted up in Ezekiel 119. So Ezekiel was to exalt these people's sin. He was to lift up their sin to them. This is not anybody just making slanderous remarks towards others this is a man standing in the place of jesus christ the messiah to come who would bear their iniquity literally redemptively for an atonement this was a man that was chosen of god was told what to do and was told that he would be manifesting to these uh, exiles the lifting up of their sin and how horrible their sin was Ezekiel 39 and verse number 25. Do you remember what the widow woman said to Elijah when she had taken him into her house and gave him the last meal that her and her son had and when he when her son died, you remember what she asked him? Have you come here to call my sin to remembrance? You remember what he answered her? Nothing. You can't answer that. If you get blamed for that, the only thing you can do is cry out to God. And that's what he did. God brought the boy's life back into him. Ezekiel was here to stand, was to stand here instead of Christ, instead of the coming Messiah to bear their iniquities up, to exalt them up, to lift them up, to present them to them, to show them how many therefores there were going to be in the book of Ezekiel, 84 of them, of things that God was going to do because of their sin, and God would have them to know it. Ezekiel 39 and verse 25. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and we be je will be jealous for my holy name. After that they have borne their shame. The words after that they have borne is akin to these phrases we've been showing you, shall exalt itself, were lifted up, thou shalt bear. But God says, I'm going to have mercy, but only after that they have borne their shame. And after that they have borne all their trespasses, wherein they have trespassed against me. He's not talking about those trespasses between neighbors or, or fellow citizens. He's talking about what these individuals did 
to me. When they dwelt safely in their land, listen, and none made them afraid. Why is it good for sinners to be afraid? The what of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I remember in God's dealing with me, I had been a baptized Baptist for seven years, but the awareness of my sinfulness began to come upon me. And the night before that I could not bear it anymore and had to confess myself as a sinner, I felt like God, that I didn't want to go to sleep, that I was afraid I'd wake up in hell. Literally, literally I really felt that way. And I believe that that was the quickening of the Lord. I believe that a sinner cannot ever want a new heart till after he already gets one. A baby doesn't cry to be able to have life. It cries because it has life. So I believe that fear, even though I didn't know it, and it took me years to understand the working of God in grace, and I still don't know it all by any, by any means, but I began to understand that that fear was God's quickening me and making me alive, and I could see myself for the first time as God saw me, more like as, as God saw me, and that fear that I had of not wanting to go lay down and go to bed that night as a teenager, I just, I, I see now that was the beginning of wisdom. That was the beginning. It also says the fear of the Lord's beginning of knowledge. So he said they were safe in their land and none made them afraid. Now I'm going to bring again to the captivity of Jacob. He's talking to captives. And I will have mercy upon the whole house of Israel. But only after they have borne their shame. You know what gets me? Modern day parenting. The little darling kick somebody on the leg and they say, say you're sorry. He says, sorry. What? And he gets away with it. What do you mean sorry? You little moron. Hey, go kick him back and let him see. I know you ain't supposed to do that. But my soul, there's no awareness of the transgression. They're living comfortably in their own realm and none can make them afraid. God said, ain't going to have it. When I have brought them again from the people and have gathered them out of the enemy's hand, lands and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, what's the next word? Then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, and don't forget it, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. I did it. It wasn't Nebuchadnezzar. It wasn't your bad political leaders. It wasn't your bad spiritual leader. It wasn't somebody saying, oops, we shouldn't have done that. Uh-oh, now we've got to go into captivity. He said, no, I did that. I want you to know that. Then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity. And he says, among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land and have left none of them any more there. Neither will I hide my face any more from them. And here's how he's going to remedy this. For I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord. That's Pentecost, folks. He said, I am not going to write the law on tables of stone anymore. I'm going to write it in their hearts. What does that mean? It means they cannot fail to do right. I will make them righteous, and he that doeth righteousness is righteous. 
and vice versa. He that is righteous doeth righteousness. You can't not do it. So the Lord said, we ain't going through this anymore. I'm going to bring them to an effectual repentance. And I'm going to bring them to an effectual grace. And they're going to know that they're sinners. And they're going to know that I am God. And their relationship to me will be one of a spiritual nation that shall be joined together by the Holy Ghost in Christ. Isn't that good? God said, there ain't no sense in going through this again. Give me the, uh, what's that saying about the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different end? God said, we ain't, I ain't crazy. We ain't going through this no more. It ain't going to work. It didn't work back then. I didn't expect it at work. I put you under 4,000 years of the law to make you understand you can't walk with God. I wish I could find that verse in Joshua 24. I wish I could find that verse in Joshua 24. I wish that verse in Joshua 24 could be found by me. He said as he turns to Joshua 24, wishing that the Lord would show it to him. Joshua 24, yeah, thank you, Lord Jesus. Joshua 24 and verse 19. And Joshua said unto the people, now you ain't going to like his speech, but listen to his leading phrase. You read it to me, down to the snake eyes. And Joshua said unto the people, That's the truth. Not in those conditions you cannot. If God says thou shalt, you have to get with Paul in Romans chapter 7 and say, that's what I did. Things I would not do, that's what I do. And you realize you can't do anything to please God. There's got to be somebody outside of the sinful human race, somebody who's man enough to die but he has to be God enough to be raised from the dead, to raise himself from the dead, and to bear our iniquities. Ezekiel can't do it. And Joshua tells him, you can't serve God. That ain't very encouraging, is it? How'd you like to have a leader that's chosen of God and first thing he does is gets up here. <clears throat> It's going to be my last speech. I'm fixing to die. You can finish out this chapter and see that he did. And he says, first thing I want you all to know, you can't serve God. For he is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. Woo, I'm glad I didn't live back there in that, aren't you? Verse 20, if you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then will he turn. Uh-oh, we're going to get God so mad he's going to turn around. It's bad when you're on a trip and you was in the back seat with your brother and sister and you was aggravating them, they was aggravating you. And he touched me, she touched me. I love you, Mama, I can't leave you. I'll give you, give you. And then your mama turns around. Ooh, you don't want your mama to turn around. There wasn't no seat belt back then. The baby was up on the back seat in the window. Had to turn the baby ever so often so they wouldn't get too burned on one side. Anyhow, no seat belts, turn around. Woo! And God turned around. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. Listen, after that he hath done you good. What kind of people are we that makes God repent? God turned. God repented. God been doing good. 
and we aggravated him so much we made him turn around and do us hurt when all he's ever wanting to do is do us good. I am so glad tonight that Jesus Christ has borne my iniquity and that he stands in my place before the eyes of a holy and just God who is this very God right here. And he hasn't changed, and, and my sin could make him turn and destroy me after he's done me good. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Glory to God, ain't God good to us? Ezekiel, you shall bear their iniquity. No, you're not going to bear their iniquity like, you know, redemption. You're not going to bear their iniquity vicariously. What does that mean? Remember them four guys that tore somebody's roof up? I never have got over that. I don't know why that man had homeowner's insurance or not, but these jaybirds went up the steps on the side of his house and tore his roof up to let this man down in the presence of Jesus because you couldn't get in. The windows were full, the doors were full, all the rooms were full, and they lowered him down, and that's called vicarious faith, Jesus said, because of their faith, your sins are forgiven. That's vicarious in somebody else's place. This was not vicarious. Ezekiel could not literally, spiritually, please God vicariously on these people's behalf. He was doing it symbolically. And I'm going to tell you something. Anytime God gives you a word to say to somebody or me a message to preach to people and you have to remind them they're sinners, the one thing it always does is remind you that you are a sinner too, just like the rest of them. And who are you standing up here and saying this because you're just as sinful as everybody else? It had to have an effect on old, poor old Ezekiel. Mm. But this was what God gave him to do. Did we get to Isaiah 59? Isaiah 59 and verse number 1. I don't think we read that. Behold. When God says that, that means look here. Behold. There's nothing wrong with the Lord's hand or the Lord's ear. The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. There ain't nothing wrong with God. Neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. He heard your cry. And he can do something about it. Because he is sovereign. Now, what's the first word in verse 2? Uh-oh. But your iniquities have separated between you and your church. No, nope. between you and your friends. No, nope. between you and your God. Uh-oh. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Wow. Our sins are the earwax in God's ear. I know that ain't pleasant to think about, but we've stopped up God's ear that it's our fault. Now listen at verse 3. In verse 1, we have the Lord's hands and, his, and the Lord's ear. Now listen at verse 3. For, number one, your hands are defiled with blood, and number two, your fingers are defiled with iniquity, and number three, your lips have spoken lies, and number four, your tongue have muttered perverseness. It ain't God's hands or his ears. It's our hands, our fingers, our lips, and our tongues. It's our iniquities that have separated us from God. That's what Ezekiel had to do. He had to bear, to lift up, to raise up, they were lifted up, thou shalt bear. You had to exalt the awareness of our sinfulness to make them understand what you're doing here under Nebuchadnezzar's captivity. No priests here. 
No blood sacrifices here. No temple here. The structure of the lineage of Aaron and the priest is interrupted. You have nothing of God at all left. Nothing. But if that ain't bad enough, I got to show you how bad your sin is. And hold on a minute. Where is that iron skillet I had? Wait a minute. I think it's over here in this. Yeah, here it is. Over behind all this stuff. You ever tried to get out a pot and pan or pan without making any noise? You can't do it. Clankety, blankety, blankety. Blank. What are you doing in there? Tearing down the kitchen? No, I'm just trying to get this pan out. What are you going to do with it? I'm going to set it up between me and Jerusalem. Verse 4, none calleth for justice. You know why? Because sinners need mercy and not justice because it would destroy them. They don't want justice. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. Don't shine that light on me. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. Verse number 12. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, that is, the Lord. Our transgressions and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and for our iniquities we know them. You can read on down through that chapter and it just break your heart to see what all God says. Ezekiel 14, Ezekiel 14, verse number 9, Ezekiel 14, 9, and if the prophet be deceived when he hath spoken a thing, I, I the Lord have deceived that prophet, I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall, even, shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. If you go find yourself a preacher that will agree with you and help you to feel comfortable in your sin, I will punish him and you that the house of Israel may go no more astray from me, neither be polluted any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, saith the Lord God. All I want is for you to be my people and me to be your God. And if you go around trying to hire preachers and hirelings that will say anything that you want them to say, I'll come after you and him. Fair enough? You remember in Ezekiel 3 that we contemplated about the blood being on Ezekiel's hands? He said, there's going to be some sinners in here. They ain't going to turn. But you better preach to them. There's going to be some good people in here, some good moral people, that they may turn into, apostate, into apostates. So there's going to be some immoral people that are going to be unrepentant, but there's going to be some that are moral Seemingly on the outside, but they're going to have the, the, the propensity to, to become apostates. But the thing you better do is tell them what I said or I'll require their blood at your hands. Caldwell said something one time, old brother Caldwell. He said, if you can put up groceries, you ought to do it and stay out of the pulpit. I agree with that. Mm. Our time's about gone. Let's see if we can deal with these 390 days real quick. I'll try. Ezekiel chapter 4. Why 390 days? He told him that he had to lay on his side, he had to set this siege up, and that there would be a, a, a day 
he says in verse 4, according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquities. For I have, verse 5, for I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of days, 390 days. Now, I am not going to try to take you back and unravel this because the very learned schoolboys, the commentators, can't agree on it. I ain't interested in finding out all their schedules in here. I just want to know this. It wasn't 389 days. It wasn't 395 days. It was three. What's your point? It was a precise, exact number. And what Ezekiel was going to have to do, and I read you the scripture where it said a day for a year. You're going to have to go through this a day for a year. And what does that mean? It means all this time God had been knowing exactly when it started and exactly when he had had enough of it and he brought Nebuchadnezzar to bear upon him. I thought about that verse, be sure. If it's, you can't be sure about anything much in this world anymore, but you can be sure about this. Be sure your sin will find you out. Turn with me real quickly to Second Chronicles. That's right after the book of First Chronicles. <laughs> Chapter 11. That's first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles. First and second Kings was written from a viewpoint from the throne. First and second Chronicles was written as a viewpoint from the temple. And I can't even go into all the history of this because we don't have time. Second Chronicles chapter 11. <clears throat> And if you want to scratch your head, read verse 15. Have you read it yet? Second Chronicles 11, 15. And he ordained him priest for the high places. You read the next phrase. The what? Mm -hmm. He made him priest for the devils? Okay. Come back and tell me about that this coming Sunday. All right, verse 16, this is Rehoboam, Solomon's son. And after them, all out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, strong three years. Wait a minute. Why not it began there and kept on going all of his life? No, just for three years. For three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. Drop down into chapter 12 and verse 1. And it came to pass when Rehoboam, the one that they made strong, had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, uh-oh, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel. And what? Wait a minute. Ain't these the guys up here that strengthened the kingdom and made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, strong and walked according to the ways of David and Solomon uh, and made sacrifices unto the Lord God of their fathers? Yes. We better be careful. It's not just in times of depravity and in times of great iniquity that you can apostatize, but you can do it in a time seemingly of revival. Let's read that again. Chapter 12, verse 1. And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. And it came to pass that in the fifth year of Rehoboam, Shashak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord.
So we find out, dear soul, that this is where it began. This is where it began. Second Chronicles 12, 13. So King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned. For Rehoboam was one and forty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naamah, an Amoritist, and he did evil. Can you tell me why he did evil? Will you finish out verse 14 for me? Because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Ooh. And God said, I remember that. That's when it started. And I was patient 390 years. 40 of those 390 were with Judah. But it's a total of 390 years. 1 Kings chapter 12. Uh-oh, I should have told you to hold your place. And we'll find it again. 1 Kings Chapter 12, verse 32. It didn't get but this three generations away from David before apostasy had set in. 1 Kings 12, 32. And Jeroboam. Ordained a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar, so did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priest of the high places which he had made. So he offered unto the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth. Very precise. God said, I got it written down. I can tell you the day, the month, the year. Even in the month which he had devised of his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel and he offered upon the altar and burned incense. Jeroboam and Rehoboam were involved in the splitting of the nation of Israel after Solomon and David. And this is where it all goes down. And God said, I can tell you the day the month, I can tell you exactly when it happened. Jeremiah 52 and verse 30. Jeremiah 52 and verse 30. And in the three and twentieth year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive of the Jews 740 and five persons. All the persons were 4,600. It's the exact day, three and twentieth year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Dear soul, let me tell you something. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. the Lord. Next phrase. I will repay. You get your eyes off of them that's doing wrong. Don't worry about it. You can pray about it. Talk to God all you want to about it, but leave him alone. Just know this. The exact time that it began and the exact time that God said, cut them off, I've had enough, was said by God and said, Ezekiel, you got 390 days to lay on your side total. 50 of the days on your right side, a 
think I got that right. According to the number of years that Israel has sinned against me. It doesn't matter what your enemy is doing to you. It, it does. But it doesn't matter what your enemy is doing to you as far as you doing anything about it. Report them to God. If you keep saying, Mama, he touched me. Mama, he touched me. She's going to turn around. You keep telling God, Lord, look what they're doing to your people. He'll turn around. He will turn and do you hurt after that he has done you. He, America is going to pay for its sins. Isn't that Psalm 917? Psalm 917, I think it's what it says. Man, I hope this is right. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. God understands and knows sin and sinners and he knows the extent of his mercy and he knows how much he is, uh, how do I say it? I'm going to just say happy. That ain't a good word. To give you mercy. He is happy to give you mercy. Aren't you glad? Yeah. Aren't you glad that it ain't Ezekiel's got to bear your iniquities? Jesus paid it all. God shall see the travail of Jesus' soul. Nobody sings about that. They sing about the nails. They sing about the thorns. But... Where is the spirituality and the perception to be able to discern that God the Father wasn't looking at that. He was looking at his soul. The first Adam said, The woman thou givest me. All right, Jesus, are you going to blame anybody? I'm looking at your soul. Is there any animosity in your heart against anybody? If it is, this atonement ain't going to work. But he absolutely died perfectly. He died with the pure imperialism of God Almighty as if it were God dying, and it was. Let's pick up that last verse in Second Chronicles 36, and we'll let Ed come lead you a song. Second Chronicles 36, 21. Verse 20, and them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. Listen, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the Lord had enjoyed her Sabbaths for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. Three score is 60 and 10 more is 70. They had to stay in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. Each one represented the endurance of God of their transgressions. And this is what Jeremiah said. If you read Daniel, he said, I got the prophet Jeremiah and I read his words and found out that we're going to be here 70 years. That's how Daniel found it out. And, and it, 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 each, each time was a year that God said, you'll be here 70 years. And that is every day is going to be a day that ain't nobody plowing the earth. For I told you not to do any work on the Sabbath day, but you wouldn't listen to me. There'll be a day when nobody's trying to break into the gates and come in and sell their goods. Like I told you not to do that. I wanted you to be different. I wanted to show you that you could only work six days a week. And I would bless you better than those heathen plowing the earth seven days a week. And you wouldn't listen. And I am not going to have you treat the earth like this. I am going to let it rest. But you're going to have to stay in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. Ezekiel, you're going to have to lay on your side 390 days according to 
the transgression of Israel, that's how you're going to make them know about you bearing their iniquity. Mm -hmm.